So this topic is monkeys, monsters, and mice. And I'm going to explain to you in the next 40 minutes about this interesting topic, and we're going to focus on the home school connection. So the first thing I want to do is just remind you of the topic itself. So on the screen, you should see an abstract, which is the content of my topic today. Just quickly read that. You can read it faster than I can speak it out to you. So just read that quickly, and I will highlight a couple of key areas. Okay, so please read on the screen. You can see my abstract there. And the key thing for me to focus on today is I'm talking about very young learners. So these are kindergarten students or very, very young learners, okay? And they're going to need lots of uh, English input, so how can we do that? And one way we can do that is having this strong connection between the school and the home and strong communication between uh, teachers and parents and children. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, and I'm going to focus on that for about 40 minutes. So our time is short, so I'm going to keep moving forward. Now, today, although we're looking at these very young learners, kindergarten students, many of the techniques I talk about for making a strong homeschool connection apply to other ages of students as well. So if you're not teaching kindergarten, I think you can still get something useful out of this session too. All right, so I've organized this session into uh, these four sections here. The first section is called Monsters, Mice, and Monkeys. And we're going to think about our very young learner students and some characteristics of them in a language classroom. In the second section, called Making the Connection, we're going to think about this home school connection idea, the connection between the classroom and the home and what this means, uh, whether the pandemic has changed anything about this home school connection and what would this look like? How would we make this connection between what we teach in the classroom and what the students do at home? In the third section, which is the largest section, I'm going to give you lots of ideas for how you can make this connection between the school and the home nice and strong to give your very young learners lots of opportunities um, to practice their language skills and to get input from their parents. And then in the final section, I will summarize these ideas. Now, just to be clear with everybody, uh, that in the chat window, the Oxford team will answer your questions about certificates and PDFs and surveys. Because time is limited today, I'm not going to stop and check the chat window all the time to answer questions or deal with technical issues. Uh, the OUP team are great, and they will support you with that. I'm going to focus on delivering my content today. But don't forget, if you do have issues, this session will be recorded and delivered to you via a link later. So let's talk now about this idea of monsters mice and monkeys. And in this section, I'm going to think about these very young learners who are aged between three or four and five or six. So these are preschool. Um, now, when I was teaching very young learners and I started my teaching career in Japan, I was working in a small town and I was visiting all of the kindergartens in the town to teach English and play with the kids. Um, I got a real shock when I first walked into the classroom with 20 kindergarten students. And all of my students were different, and they all had different strengths and weaknesses. Now, let me give you a, a challenge, okay? I'd like you to complete this sentence. So you can look at the image on the screen to help you. My class are all little... Mm. Insert the missing word. What do you think that missing word would be? Looking at the picture on the screen. Ah, I can see some answers coming in. Yes. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So my class are all little monsters. Excellent. Let's take a look at this next one. I'll give you a hint on the screen. My student Annie is a naughty... Mm. 
my student Annie is a naughty, what would you say? A naughty monkey. Yes, exactly right, yeah. Uh, and the final one, I have a student called David, and he's as quiet as a, he's as quiet as a, exactly, yes, as quiet as a mouse. Great, everybody. I think we're going to break the chat window, so, so let's slow down in the chat window. Exactly. So in English, we use these expressions. They're not rude. We use them to describe small children. So um, little monsters, naughty monkeys, and being as quiet as a mouse. And I had students who were all of those things. So I had 20 kindergarten together. Some were quiet like a mouse. Some were uh, naughty like a monkey. And some were kind of bad like a monster, actually. Now, there's one other kind of monster. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, I live and work in Japan, so a very popular phrase in Japanese is monster parento. So monster parents, parents who can be very tough on teachers and very tough on schools and very demanding. Now, we're not going to talk about difficult parents today. Um, I'm sure that as parents yourselves, uh, you may have experience working with language schools, etc. We're going to focus on the children today. and. Um, one of the things that I want to discuss is, why am I talking about monsters, mice, and monkeys? Well, in a class, we have all of these very young learners. And we might have a mixture of monsters, mice, and monkeys. But they can change very, very quickly. Let's just think about these, these animals or these monsters for a minute. Even monsters, right, on the inside, OK, they have a good side as well. So they might be monsters one minute, but cute and cuddly another minute. Right? They can change very quickly. These naughty monkeys, right? monkeys are very intelligent, and they're very inquisitive. They often have interesting ideas. They want to know what's happening. They'll come and see what you're doing, all of these kinds of things. So naughty monkeys could be one moment, and the next minute, those very same monkeys are fascinated by what you are doing and want to learn more. And quiet mice, mice can also be brave as well. Many cultures have stories about mice scaring elephants or mice helping uh, lions, for example. So even quiet mice can be brave sometimes as well. And my point here is that these young learners can change instantly in the classroom. But what this means is, in our very short lessons, very young learner lessons are often kind of 30 to 45 minutes. For even a short period, they may be interested in learning language with you and playing with you. And for most of the lesson, they may seem quiet or isolated or not interested at all. So teaching these very young learners in a short lesson is a real challenge. Their exposure and focus on English might be for a very short time. right? And what this means is that we need to have these very young learners exposed to English as much as possible when they get home. So at home, the exposure to English supplements what they do in the classroom. Okay? And if the child is like you can see on the screen here, they may experience multiple different emotions in one short lesson. And only some of the time, they want us to focus on what you're doing. And this is why with these very, very young learners, reinforcing what happens in the classroom at home is super, super important. right? And this is why I want to talk about the home school connection today. So. Let's now look at making this connection. If we agree that it's important to have a strong uh, input, English input, when the children are at home, how can we make this connection between the school and you, the teacher, and the parents at home and take advantage of this? So in this section, I'm going to explore ways that we can make a connection between the school and the home. So on the screen here, you can see different parts of the homeschool connection. We've got the school at the bottom of the screen here, maybe using some material. And in the top left here, you've got the parent working with the child at home. 
And on the top right there, maybe if you're teaching online, even with these very young learners, they're doing something online as well. So I used to get very frustrated. I have two uh, now teenage daughters, but they were when they were young learners, uh, they would come home from school and I would say, oh, what did you do at school today? And you know what they said? I don't remember, which was very frustrating for me as a parent, right? It's understandable because they're young and their minds are full of different ideas, but it was very frustrating as a parent. And this is one reason why we want this strong homeschool connection. So in the simplest way, a homeschool connection is um, connecting the curriculum that you're talking about in the classroom. So connecting the curriculum in the classroom to the home in some way, maybe sharing with the parents what the child has done with you. And of course, you probably all do that already with homework and so on. That's very, very natural. Um, reinforcing language that they learn in the classroom at home, again, is really important at this very young age to give maximum English input for the students. So you might have the student in the middle here. Um, and in many countries, that uh, contact might come once a week. For example, in Korea, it might be once a week. In some place, it might be every day, depending on the nature of the school, a short phone call, etc. However, if we go deeper, right, um, we want to make sure that we connect or make a connection between the school and the teacher in terms of communication, not just what is in the curriculum, but regular communication so that the parents know what is going on. And this is important because it shows that you are providing a solid education for their children. If they are paying for the education, that you're providing good value for money, etc. So that communication with the parent on a regular basis is really important. But we also have the child here as well. So connecting the parent to the child by using English at the home is really important. Learning together. And I'm sure you know the expression, the family that plays together stays together. So English can be really important as a way of connecting parents with their young child as well. And finally, there is that connection um, back between the child, the parent, and back to you. So if the child is doing homework or activities that you provide, they're bringing that back into the classroom. So completing this connection between all three parties. And this cycle is really, really important. So that's why I want to focus on it today. But you can see how this is a cycle, okay, with all the different parties influencing each other and working together. But I want to be very careful when we talk about the homeschool connection, we're not only talking about giving homework today, we're talking about regular communication, we're talking about helping parents to use English with their children. So it goes beyond just setting homework. Um, now, this has become even more important recently, okay, because of something we're all familiar with, COVID-19, which has changed classrooms and changing education around the world. Now, on the screen, you can see something here called ERT. And ERT is a relatively new phrase that's used in education. I don't know if you can guess what it stands for, so I'll give you a hint using pictures. I love to use pictures with learning. And you can see two pictures on the screen, maybe a police car and a fire engine or a fire truck. ERT, very good, I can see some of you. The E stands for emergency, okay? But the rest of it stands for um, emergency remote teaching. Now, what is emergency remote teaching? Well, you might be thinking, Ollie, this homeschool connection just makes good sense. We all do that anyway. However, with the impact of COVID-19, when COVID-19 hit, many online classes immediately sprung up very quickly, and this was ERT, emergency remote teaching, doing anything you could teaching online to young learners so that they were still getting some English lessons and some English input. However, 
we're moving past the ERT phase now. Okay? Parents, learners, um, expect regular planned communication if you are teaching online. So instead of just focusing on the getting the students to study online, now we're going beyond this point and we want to build up regular and strong communications. And a strong homeschool connection is very important even if your country has not had a lockdown now because if you do go into lockdown, you need to be ready to make sure you're having this strong ongoing connection to help your very young learners learn English at home. So you need to be prepared. For example, the UK has just gone into full lockdown again last Thursday. And this is another reason why this homeschool connection is really, really important to prepare for. OK, now um, one thing to think about is how do you communicate? And I'm going to put some ideas on the screen for you here. This could be a regular phone call. It could be updating a school blog, a vlog or a video log, for example, email, social media, newsletters. But I must say, the key thing is keep it manageable and repeatable. Don't try and do all these different things if your organization is not set up for it. Just do one or two things regularly and do them well. That's the key thing. And the most important thing to remember here is timely and regular communication. That's what parents um, expect and that's the minimum that you should deliver. You don't have to suddenly master all of these different ways of communication in communicating with your parents. Choose what works for you. For example, if you're not comfortable using video and recording on a computer like this, just use a mobile phone to record a short message. And I bought this camera tripod for three US dollars at a dollar store. And it keeps my video nice and stable so I look professional. A short video message is all that's necessary on a regular basis to keep parents up to date. So I'm not going to talk about all the different ways you can do these things. Those are some things for you to explore. And when you get the recording of this session and the link, you can look at those in more detail. But don't forget the power of the computer in your hand. You can record audio messages. You can record short video messages and share those via social media or a blog, for example, to your parents. Very simple. OK, so in this section now, I'm going to focus on these different activities that you can do to help you create a strong homeschool connection. So I'm going to just simply deliver here a variety of different ideas, and you can pick up some different ideas if you want. So again, I'm not expecting you to do all of these different things. You would do what works for you. Now, to get you started, please remember today I'm going to use examples from Show and Tell, which is a kindergarten course by Oxford University Press. Okay? And the reason I'm going to use this is because it already has lots of different resources for making that strong homeschool connection. Okay? And it's inspired different ideas in me, and I will hope it will inspire different ideas in you. Now, if you're not using Show and Tell, don't worry. Many of these ideas you can do yourself with different materials, or you can create yourself. I'm just using this as an example to get you thinking about all of the different things that we can do. Now, like any good modern course book, it comes with teacher's materials. It comes with classroom resources like flashcards and a puppet. Um, but I want to focus today on the things that you can download. So today I'm going to show you materials from the teacher's website, which is uh, free to access. I'm going to show you materials from the student website, which is free to access as well with games and activities. And I'm also going to share with you the parents' website. Parents are so important, so providing materials for them to use is key as well. Now, when you receive this session as a PDF, these will all be web links, so you can just go directly to the place later on. OK, so when we look at these activities that you can do in the home, 
Again, I'm going to draw on existing materials which are available. And so just to remind you that, for example, you can go to what we call Oxford Parents, which is this site here. Okay, that will be a link in the PDF. But we have a parent site for the course. There is a student site with activities. There is a teacher's site where you can download ideas and teacher's guides and so on. And finally, there's the teacher's resource center. So this is where I'm going to draw my materials from today. But even if you don't do these things, it's the idea that's important. And that's what I want to share with you. Now, when we look at these activities, I just want to say that I'm not trying to train the parent to replace the teacher. Some parents are very good with English language. Some have no experience with English language at all. So my focus is on simple things that they can do or you can give them to keep that connection going between what you do with your very young learners. And these will be fun and easy to implement with parents at home. So the simpler, the better. We also need to acknowledge not all parents want to do lots and lots of different activities. So that's another reason we want to keep things simple and achievable. So what could we do? Well, at the start of the year, let's look at communication. So we talked in the earlier section about tools you could use. And at the start of the year, I would always send a simple letter to the parents. This is a sample letter on the screen that we provide for show and tell. And it introduces the parents to what their child is going to do across the year, the characters that they're going to meet, and why the material they're going to use is helpful to them. Now, if your parents don't speak English, you could do a version of this in your own language or record a short video message. The key thing here is setting out regular communication between yourself and the parents so that you can then go on and they know what to expect. So in this case, you can download parents' letters for show and tell from the parents' site. So a strong start with a parents' letter or an introductory video. Really, really important, but simple to do to establish communication. Then, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, I might communicate something like a unit guide. Now, many courses have a unit guide. This explains to the parents what their child will do in the unit that they are studying with you in the class. So sometimes, if you're teaching online, parents will be hovering in the background, paying attention. But if they're with you in the class, maybe not. So this unit guide lays out what the, what the children will study with you. Again, it's an example of communicating about the content which you will do with them. It's got the goals of the unit here and what language the children will learn. Now, it also has activity suggestions. And this is something we're going to focus on now, is simple ideas which parents can do at home with their children. Earlier today, my colleagues talked to you about um, using readers, for example, using puppets. But the home is a wonderful place to study and practice English. There are a lot of resources there. For example, taking photos with your mobile phone and showing them to your kindergartner and exploring the photos together. Who's this? Granddad, mom, dad, brother, sister. So sharing these ideas is really, really important. OK, now I talked about, um, and my colleagues also talked about this, giving the teachers ideas, or sorry, giving the parents ideas that they can do at home. Now, parents are not all trained teachers, and this is the advantage you have. So they don't necessarily have the skills to use the materials effectively when they're working with their very young children. So let me give you an example. As teachers, storytelling is very natural for you and easy to do. But telling a story in a different language can be a real challenge for a parent. So how can we demonstrate to parents what they can do? Well, with show and tell, we've got 32 different teacher development videos, which are designed for teachers to give you and your team more teaching skills. But we could also use these with parents, because they provide a visual demonstration of how to use material. 
So let me give you an example here. I'm going to ask the moderator to put the video on the screen, the professional development video on the screen here, and I'll just play a few seconds with you. Okay, and I'm going to play from about 28 seconds, and we'll see a model of how a teacher is using a puppet and asking questions about a story. Picture. Okay, let me just get to where I want to be. And gets them to watch how our show help you. Hey, there we go. Let's watch how our show and tell teacher encourages her class to engage with the new topic and gets them speaking. Okay, children, look at the picture. What can you see? A classroom, right? Just like ours. Good job. And what colors? Now, as you can see, this is very simple, but it's a good model for a parent of how to ask questions about an image and exploit that image and really use it for language input. Let's see a few more seconds. Blue, pink, green, yellow, red, purple. Okay, I'm going to stop there because of time today, but you can see with a visual example, we can give parents very, very easily an idea of how they could explore the material on the page. So moderator, please remove that video, please. Okay, so if you don't have access to these teacher development videos, you could show yourself or you could give examples um, using uh, maybe a screen capture or a video. One of the tools which is really, really useful is called Loom, and Loom, L-O-O-M, is not by Oxford University Press, so use it at your own. Uh, be careful when you use it. It's not provided by us, but it's a tool for you to record your screen and capture of a video of yourself demonstrating materials um, so that parents can watch that at home. Okay, so let's go on. And let's explore this idea of using the home for learning language. So you can suggest ideas for things that parents can do to use their home as a kind of language laboratory. And the home is a really exciting place for using language. And most parents don't really think of that. They don't necessarily think of how they could use their smartphone to take photos of their family members, to ask questions and exploit photos in the home, even something as simple as taking photos together of the child's toys and reviewing the language on the smartphone or reviewing the language by picking up the toys and using them. The home is a wonderful language learning place, so we can encourage parents to use those tools to reinforce and practice language with the children. And one thing that some uh, teachers do when they're teaching online is to set a task where the parent, where the child has to run and bring something back and show it on the camera. Even simple fun things like that, using the materials from the home. Now, of course, one other very useful tool is video, and video has become one of the most effective ways for students to get extra input. And with parents being more connected than ever before, video is widely available and we can use lots of video. So this can be watched on a mobile device. Uh, it can be used on a smartphone. It can be downloaded so you don't have to be online all the time. The power of video now is that it is in the hands of everybody. Parents can use video with young learners. So when I was a young teacher a long time ago, we had video VHS cassettes and they were always locked away in the teacher's cupboard and we maybe use them once or twice a year. But now video can be shared and used at home all the time. And in show and tell, uh, children can watch the videos at the, at the uh, student's website for free and download them as well. And this reinforces what they've learned in the classroom. So the key thing with this homeschool connection is not only to make sure that you have the videos, but to explain to parents where to get them 
and show them how to use videos for language learning. We don't want video to be a passive babysitter. Using video should be like using a storybook, thinking about what's on the screen, pausing it to ask questions, getting language use out of the video. I don't like for tablets and smartphones to be like a pacifier, which children just use uh, passively. I want them to really interact with what they see on the screen, and that is a great use of video. So don't forget that if you don't have access to video with your course book, you can look for video on YouTube or other resources, but do be careful. Make sure you watch the whole video all the way through and check that it's appropriate for these very young learners before you share it with them and their parents. The parents don't have time to go and seek out the right kinds of video, and this is another connection that you can make for them by directing to them directing them to resources which they can use and trust. And as I mentioned before, on the student site for Show and Tell, you can watch these videos online. We have animated stories for each video in the book. Okay. Now, speaking of stories, another thing to remember is how to exploit stories and use them at home. And on the screen here, you can see an example of a coloring activity. So any time you teach a story with students in the classroom, don't forget to set a simple follow activity that the parents can do with the child at home. And this could be something as simple as coloring. But if you do set an activity like this, don't forget to also give the parents the language that they can use as well. So here with this coloring activity, we can see the structure is what's this, it's a, and that way the parent can practice this with the child as they're coloring together. Now these kinds of activities are also good for practicing fine motor skills. Students are developing their skills using their coloring and writing accurately, but even something as simple as this done at home and repeating things like colors provides that extra use of the language which reinforces and reviews what you've done in the classroom. But again, it's not just enough to give this kind of homework to the child. What's best is to give the parents examples of how they would use this material for maximum effect. So repeating the colors as you're using them and so on. Now, in the previous workshop, my colleague June gave you three tips for reading, so I'm not going to spend too long on this, but of course, don't forget the value of reading with uh, parents at home. Super important. Serious parents will want to read with their children, and we can share how we read with the child. Okay? So don't forget that as a teacher, you can recommend resources which you know fit with your curriculum, or that you know the children will love, or will be appropriate for them. And many of these materials you can download and use on a device. These are two books in our series called Oxford Read and Imagine. And these are simple storybooks and readers which you can use um, to read at home with children. And they also have activities as well. Now, one of my favorites is drama and puppets. Do you use drama? Do you use puppets with your very young learners? I hope so, because I think that puppets are one of the most effective tools for teaching and learning with very young learners. So on the screen here, you can see uh, a homemade puppet. This is a finger puppet, which you can cut out. And you can get this uh, from the teacher's club or the teacher's site, and you can find lots of different um, webinar, uh, lots of different PDFs uh, for free from something like the Oxford Teachers Club, which you can download and cut out. The other thing about these is they're very easy to make at home. So on the screen, you can share um, or you can see some finger puppets that I made from paper plates. So this is my uh, paper plate Easter rabbit. He's very playful and he's great if I'm working on video or if I'm even in the classroom to use with the kids. And you can see that the kids could make their own paper plate puppets very, very simply. They should always be supervised by an adult, but making this together using simple language like cut, glue, tape is a great way to provide input for your students. 
I've also got another example here of a cute character, which is a piece of card stuck onto a Q-tip, which you can use very effectively as well. And these are great to make together. My final one is uh, a pair of rabbit ears that I made with one of my daughter's hairbands. Shh, don't, don't tell them. I think they're still looking for some of their hairbands, which I've stolen and used to make my rabbit ears for telling Easter stories. Okay, but very, very simple ways that you can use drama and puppets together. And the kids will love to make these and use them together. And remember that for them, a puppet is a real living being, not just a fantasy character. Okay, moving swiftly on, I'm just going to mention projects. So um, materials like show and tell, they have projects built in. But a project, as long as it's simple, is a great activity for parents to do with children. And again, this helps to make this connection between the home and the language and content of your curriculum um, more real, more impactful, um, providing more exposure for the students. And there's lots of things at home that young learners can do, even if it's just creating nameplates, as you can see here. Again, practicing the simple alphabet and phonics together. Or it might be something more complicated, like a show which you could do at the end of the year. So projects are something definitely to look at. But again, keep it nice and simple. We don't want to overburden parents at this stressful time with lots, with too much for them to do. So think about how achievable a project is to do at home and keep it simple so that it's nice and easy for the parent and the language is easy to use too. Whatever you do, don't forget to encourage the use of a scrapbook. Now, scrapbooks might seem a little old fashioned, but they're really important ways for collecting the child's activities together okay, and keeping them in one place. And that's a wonderful memento for the parent as the child gets older. I have scrapbooks of my daughter's work when they were very young, and they're still beautiful. I still love looking at them. But these can also be used for assessment. So if you do a project or if the child makes a puppet together with you, make sure that there's a scrapbook that keeps everything together. Really, really important. It also makes a lovely memory. And you can use it as a way of reviewing language that has been done together as you've been working on making some of these things at home. Right, I think I've got just two minutes left. So I do want to mention songs. Songs, of course, and singing songs at home are a great way to provide fun, extra input that link to your curriculum. And modern textbooks have lots of songs which you can use. Show and Tell has songs which you can download from the student's site as MP3s, for example. And you can listen to these, find your favorite song, ask the parents to play the song throughout the week. Something that I really like is routine songs. Now, these very young learners, don't forget, sometimes they can be monsters. Sometimes they can be monkeys. Sometimes they can be mice. And we can help parents with their children at home by sharing routine songs together. So if you want the very young learner to tidy up their room, you can sing the cleanup song. If you want them to wash your hands, very important these days, the soap and water song. So these routine songs are wonderful to do at home and in the classroom. And that's making a connection, again, between these two places that keeps English language input alive even at home. OK, in the final minutes, just to mention online games and apps. Uh, many parents like to use these these days. So things like online games, uh, for example, Show and Tell has a student site where you can access these and show them in your browser or on your smartphone or on your tablet. Um, these provide extra language inputs to reinforce what the students have learned with you in the lesson. And they're great fun. Okay? As I mentioned earlier, I don't want the tablet to be a pacifier. I want the students to do something with what they're seeing. And online apps and games allow you to do that. And Show and Tell also has an app with a company called Lingo Kids which provides extra games which children can do um, to reinforce the activities that they do with you in the classroom. And they can do this at home. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when I share this with you as a PDF in the next week or 10 days, 
all of the links will be in here for you to click and find out more for yourself so you can just access everything via the PDF. Now I've got to finish, so just a word on assessment. For these very young learners, assessment should be informal, looking at worksheets, looking at what they've done. I'm not going to do formal tests with them, but if you do want those materials, you can usually download them off the publisher's website, and I use them more for practice and just to give the parent and the child the idea that they are moving forward. I'd rather use something like a scrapbook, to be honest, and keeping all those things together. Now, it really is time for me to finish, and we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of different ideas to make that homeschool connection strong, so let me just summarize, and then I will leave you for the rest of your day. So we talked about monsters, mice, and monkeys in the first section, and the idea that children can change so quickly, these kindergartners, which makes that what they do at home even more important to reinforce the lesson. We looked at how we can make the connection between the home and the school using things like messages, vlogs, social media, blog post updates, etc. And in the third section, I showed you 10 to 15 different kinds of activity which we can help parents to do at home to make that homeschool connection really strong. So in summary, let me finish with three key points. First of all, a strong homeschool connection is vital, more vital than ever before with these very young learners, especially if, unfortunately, you have to go into lockdown again and students need to be learning at home. Secondly, a homeschool connection connects teachers, parents, and children. It's not just communicating what you've done in the class, but setting them up for success by sharing ideas for how parents can do things as well to keep the English flowing in the home environment. And finally, do please go beyond communicating what was done in class and really empower parents to use English with their students at home by explaining to them what to do and also how to do it.